Mr. Renato, I was interested in your, your comment there that the, the reasons for the war change almost every day, which they do seem to do, which, uh, you know, if, the, if, the, if there was even a coherent excuse for a war, it ought to be the same coherent lying excuse. Give, give Blair his due there. He kept up with the same lie. He didn't, he didn't change it every day. Uh, but they get in a pickle with the lies because one of the reasons, of course, that we went, one of the main reasons, right from the beginning, and they still come up when it's that day of the week that this is the reason, is democracy. We're trying to introduce democracy into Afghanistan, and they're doing this despite the fact that they have gone to the most extraordinary length to install in Afghanistan, as leader, a man who came to uh, be the leader through an election that then immediately had to be rerun because the election was corrupt. And that was the, the democratically elected leader that they've put in there. Uh, to the extent that an organisation called a human rights group called Transparency International, I know, has published a league table of the world's most corrupt countries in which Afghanistan came second after Somalia. Such is the, <laughs> such is the, the, the achievement there so far. And I can't help thinking that Karzai was probably a little bit put out by that and felt that he could have won it, really. But, <laughs> And it's probably a bit cross with Somalia and thinks, well, we could have won that if only we bribed the right judges. But that's, that's the achievement on that. Gordon Brown, the beleaguered Gordon Brown, um, said during the election campaign, when Afghanistan was mentioned as it, as it was so rarely, that when he, in answer to this charge, that in order to deal with corruption, we seem to have installed a corrupt regime, uh, he said, we are hoping for some early action on this corruption. Which is, I wonder how early it, should, it, it can be when you've spent eight years in a war to think, well, uh, in a fairly early stage of the next part of this, um, part after the eight years, we be, well, how on earth is the nonsense of it, the complete incoherence of it? Yes, we are going to deal with the corruption that we're there, that we've installed, having promised to get rid of it in the first place because it's only been eight years. You think even a builder, even the worst builder, after eight years of doing absolutely nothing, if you said, well, are you going to start any point soon? Wouldn't say we're going to have one more cup of tea because we do want to get an early start <laughs> and we'll only be a few more minutes. This is a, a completely incoherent, even by poor beleaguered Gordon Brown's uh, standard in, the, in those moments. And the people that are underneath Karzai, the Asian Times, uh, there's a report in the Asian Times, US and NATO contingents spend hundreds of millions of dollars annually on Afghan security providers, most of which are local warlords guilty of human rights abuses. So even if you say that this was uh, a war that was in order to install democracy and get rid of the warlords, fair dues, they have got rid of some of the warlords, and they've replaced them with other warlords <laughs> who are guilty of human rights abuses, but we're now paying hundreds of millions of pounds for them. None of that makes sense. The argument, if you can remember back to when the war first started, that it was the heroin trade. This was the argument that was on the front pages of papers and came out of the politicians' mouths, both in Britain and America, almost every day. If you were against it, don't you care about the heroin? What about the heroin? If you don't care about anything else, what about that? There's now three times the production of opium that there was at the time. So again, an extraordinary achievement there. And of course, one of the ones that every now and again they come up with when they get a bit flustered, as they did at the beginning, women's rights. We're, we're aiming to introduce women's rights. That's what our role is out there in the Middle East. That's what we're particularly proud of. And always think, you, uh, of course, yes, because that is what we do. We, don't, we don't, can't stand a country that is so appalling on and, uh, and women's rights. That's why we only sell hundreds of millions of dollars worth of arms every year to feminist countries like Saudi Arabia, <laughs> where it's where it's you can, uh, you can barely walk through the streets of Riyadh without being sold a Virago book. Uh, <laughs> but every Every one of the arguments makes so little sense. The idea of terrorism being the reason. So many ridiculous flaws in that argument. The 7-7 seven, seven bombers came from Leeds. Are they next? This is uh, the, the, all, the, all the inquiries that are coming out about Iraq from senior people in the intelligence say that in Iraq it clearly made the threat of terrorism in this country far, far more serious, which is something that, all right, they now say that, but of course anyone with any sense who played a fleeting glance to the situation knows that that was absolutely the case. 
Um, and yet, all of these things now that come out of these sort of leaks that have come out that Lindsay was referring to today, again, the incoherence of their arguments that they say, well, I know it's one of the, just, just saying this in the news for I was coming out, the argument seems to be, but these, these, these civilian casualties that we were taught, that, that are being talked about, they were about four or five years ago. They've stopped now. This was a report that was, that was about four or five years ago. If only the report had come out a year later, if only these leaks dealt with a slightly later period, we'd put a stop as if it was just some sort of bureaucratic area. Error, we forgot to keep killing civilians, but we put that right. Of course it's a nonsense. And if there is one, um, one document, if you like, that wasn't just leaks, but that is official, that really tells you, I think, why these civilian casualties get killed and why it's not just a matter of, of a mistake here and an error there and the wrong bit of paper being filled in, or they forgot to tick the box that said, we don't want civilian casualties. The Savile Inquiry, there was one little passage in that that I think was so important because it was about so much more than Northern Ireland, where it talked about how, in that situation, the soldiers started to see every civilian in the area as a potential terrorist as part of the enemy. And of course that's the case. Of course when you're an occupying army that becomes more and more unpopular. Of course that's the case. Everybody is a potential enemy. Everyone's a potential threat. They don't want you there. And so everybody therefore uh, uh, is liable to end up on this list of civilian casualties whether or not that gets, that gets leaked. All of that is the case. And yet, Lindsay said, so much opposition to it, so brilliant that there are people like uh, Joe Glenton. It's an extraordinary courageous thing that he did, Joe. And yet, yeah, the way that this is the way that he's dealt with, put in jail for this, what that means now in this peculiar country, it means that if you tell the truth to try to stop a war, you are put in jail. However, if you tell a series of lies in order to try and start a war, then seven years later you'll be called for five minutes for an inquiry and then let go to make millions of pounds speaking around the world. Again. That's, that's, and again, again the, the incoherence of it, the idea we have to we have to jail people like Joe Glinton as a, as a as a warning to other people, or what is it? Why what is it? Because he's a threat to society. I mean, if we let him roam around without putting him in jail, he might have gone and done it again. He might have he might have refused to serve in all other sorts of wars, and then where we would be, the public wouldn't be safe. There's no sense at all. I always think it must be peculiar for him in a way when he joined the army and said he was going to Afghanistan. He must have thought, well, you know, there is a fair chance that as a result of this I could end up in captivity and I don't suppose it ever occurred to him that that would be because he'd be jailed by the British Army. Uh, of course when they talk about it, so it tells you so much about so, so much about the role of the army in Afghanistan and the role of British Army in recent years as well when you look at the the, the reasons why Joe was jailed because you're not supposed to have an opinion. But of course that's not the case. We see soldiers interviewed on the television fairly regularly. The soldiers that say, for whatever reasons, that they think that the war is being won, although it's increasingly hard, I would imagine, to find those sorts of soldiers. But you do hear those. You do hear people, very senior people in the army, such as one that went off to support the Conservatives, saying that he thought the war in Afghanistan could be won. And it seems that you are allowed to have an opinion in the army as long as it's the one that they want you to have. The opinion you're not allowed to have is the one that is staringly obvious because it's, see, it's blindingly obvious because you see it every day. Presumably they're not allowed to notice things. Otherwise it might lead them to having an opinion. They're not allowed to notice people don't like them and don't want them being there. They're not allowed to notice that they're actually creating uh, rather than preventing future terrorist threats. So the opinions are only one way. But... That does leave the reason, just too very quickly, very quickly, I suppose, it does leave us wanting to know what the reason is why they're there. And I think one of the amazing things of this, part of it's accident, isn't it, that George Bush and his people, at the time this war started, had a plan. All those things that seem extraordinary now because they all 
that at least the names are done away with, the full spectrum dominance and the project for the new American century and so on, and all these sort of macabre and sinister plans that people like Rumsfeld that are, are so <coughs> happily forgotten now. Uh, but all of these people had that plan. But I think, as Lindsay said, they're now very embarrassed about the fact that this isn't working. And they're certainly unsure about how they can get out of it without making it look as if they're going to lose face. That's what the main aim now of is the war. Oh dear, we mustn't lose face. We must, we must carry on killing these civilians, whether or not it gets leaked that that's happening. We must carry on with British soldiers being killed in order that the people that are at the top of society in a few countries that are prosecuting this war don't lose face. And that's why I think for our side it's so crucial to realise, we think this through, that it's not true that nothing is changing on our side. It could seem like that when you come to the same place and there's much the same people here and so on. You think, is anything changing? And yet when you think about how the last five or six years has gone, it has changed enormously. Whatever you think of Obama, and of course there are you know, many, many reasons to have enormous reservations about Obama, but even so, I think it, is, it would have seemed extraordinary 18 months before he was elected that it would have been possible for there to be a president elected in America who consistently said that he campaigned against the, the Iraq war, which he did. Now that's an extraordinary, whatever you think about Obama's reservations and how he's let a lot of people down and so on, nonetheless that is an extraordinary change that took place. And it took place because millions of people around the world inspired by the hundreds of people who met in rooms like this and did all the things that campaigners do, started to change the mood and change the tide and with all the letters that were written to the papers and all the demonstrations that felt as if they might not be working and so on and there must have been many many times when all of us have gone on things and think did that really make any discernible difference to the world and yet bit by bit all of these little things and all of the little protests and the tiny little things that people do have combined to make up one huge movement that around the world means that now there is a consensus really, on obviously not a total consensus, not a unanimous one, but there is a growing consensus that the war is wrong and that it has to be got rid of and I think the world is a very, very different place now than it would have been if no one had campaigned. They almost certainly would have bombed Iran by now, but for the fact that the millions of people that around the world campaigned and argued and protested and made whatever gesture they could to say that we don't want this. I mean, I was amazed a few months ago when Salma Yacoub was on Question Time, BBC One's Question Time, and in Wooten Bassett. Now there's a tough gig, right? You are a, a <laughs> Muslim woman, anti-war campaigner in Wooten Bassett. It's almost like one of these dreams you have where you think, oh, no, how could that happen? And she was in there and partly because of her own prowess, which is considerable, but also because the, the, the mood is there for this to happen, then she was able to win over the, the crowd to her way of thinking. I don't think there's an enormous gap between the people who are sort of uh, lining the streets in Wooten Bassett and the, the opinions of people who are uh, against the war. We're after the same things, which is less deaths for no apparent reason after, after all. And for that reason, I think surely we have to go on campaigning against the war, firstly because that's the right thing to do, but also because we are, bit by bit, making a huge difference.